In April 2009, eight-year-old Tori Stafford vanished on her way home from school. In the days that followed, suspicion immediately fell on Tori's mother, Tara McDonald. Her media appearances raised eyebrows, and when CCTV footage of someone with Tori outside her school was released, it further fueled the rumors of her involvement. However, when another lead came in, an entirely new person was thrown into the mix, and eventually, that person would come clean about what really happened. Victoria Elizabeth Marie Stafford was born on July 15, 2000, to parents Tara McDonald and Rodney Stafford. Tori, as she was affectionately known, spent her early years in Woodstock, Ontario, living with her mother and older brother, Darren. Rodney and Tara had split not long after Tori was born. Both of them battled with drug addiction, and this led to a tumultuous upbringing for Tori and Darren. Thankfully, they could spend time with their grandmother when things weren't going well at home. Tara had to move frequently, and this meant Tori and Darren often changed schools before they could settle into their new surroundings. To add to the general stresses, things were tight financially. To keep the family afloat, Tara sometimes took the children's toys to local pawn shops in exchange for cash, hoping to fetch them by the end of the month. Despite living through a difficult childhood, Tori was still a bright, bubbly young girl. She loved to play and watch shows on Disney Channel. Tori was also incredibly close with her older brother, Darren. On April 8, 2009, eight-year-old Tori went about her usual day, going to school at Oliver Stevens Public School. The family had recently moved home, which happened to be situated just a short walk away from Tori and Darren's school. This meant that the pair would be able to walk home together, and Tara wouldn't need to pick them up. That was exactly what was supposed to happen once school ended that day. However, there was a slight change of plans when 11-year-old Darren first wanted to walk home with some of his friends. These friends lived close to the school, so close, in fact, that you could see their home from the school grounds. Darren thought he could walk with them there before turning around to pick up his sister. But, when he arrived back at the school, Darren couldn't find his sister anywhere. Darren had only been gone for around ten minutes, so the fact that Tori wasn't there confused him. After waiting a bit longer to see if she was still there, Darren concluded that Tori must not have wanted to wait for him and walked home by herself. He then set off home, fully expecting to find his sister there. By the time he got through the door and discovered Tori was not actually home, the feeling that something was seriously wrong had wafted over him. Tara was at home at the time, and Darren went to her and explained what had happened. As previously mentioned, the pair were very close, and Darren was getting seriously stressed about where his sister might be. Wanting to be proactive, Darren hopped onto his bike and began riding around the neighborhood, looking for his little sister. Unfortunately, she was nowhere to be seen. Tara began phoning all of Tori's friends' families, thinking she may have walked home with one of them. While doing this, Tara also called her mother to tell her what was going on. After finding out that Tori wasn't with any of her friends, she was reported missing at 6.04 p.m. by Tori's grandmother. The authorities arrived at Tori's home and began questioning Tara about the day's events. The fact that Tara wasn't the one who reported Tori missing raised some suspicions for the detectives, as did the amount of time it took to file the report. Still, a search was launched for Tori, and news quickly spread of her unexplained disappearance. The entire area was on high alert, unsure if someone was prowling the streets for another child. Oliver Stevens Public School was closed for five days while the investigation was underway for fear of another child going missing. The investigators questioned everyone they could think of and were coming up empty with any helpful leads. It seemed no one had seen anything strange, and Tori had just vanished after leaving school that day. That was until they were able to access CCTV cameras from around Tori's school, and the footage revealed something hair-raising. There Tori was, outside her school, walking alongside an unknown woman in a white coat. 
description of Victoria and the clothing descriptors provided for her. Walking with an unidentified person on Fife Ave yesterday in the area of Walter Street at approximately 3.32 p.m. according to that video camera's uh, time. And although police cannot positively identify... Tori didn't seem to be worried or struggling in the footage. While it was grainy, it was obvious that Tori was not being dragged or pulled by this mystery woman. Instead, she was walking alongside her quite comfortably. This led the police to their newest theory. This woman had to have been someone known to Tori, and she happened to have incredibly similar features to Tara. They had already been suspicious of her, and now a woman was spotted on CCTV alongside Tori walking away from the school. It seemed logical that the most obvious person for Tori to leave with happily would be her own mother. Tara had been making news appearances during the days following Tori's disappearance, and she had been gaining some significant attention from the public for her behavior. It's not uncommon for people to scrutinize family members of missing persons for their reactions, or lack thereof, in front of the cameras. Some accused Tara of not seeming sad enough or worried enough about her missing daughter, and the authorities were no doubt also watching these interviews. Yesterday you mentioned that it could be a, a man dressed up as a woman. Where, where, There's how possibilities. Did you come up with that? Like I mean, I just the walk. The, I, I'm not sure. Like I don't, I don't know. It's a possibility. It's just something that I thought. Like it, you know, if I was going to steal a child, I would not go out dressed like I normally am dressed. You know, I wouldn't. I would do everything I could to try to throw off. Like I don't think they even realized that there was a camera. That doesn't matter how long. <laughs> We're still going to maintain hope. She's going to come home. It doesn't matter if it's a week or a month. We're going to find her no matter where she is. We're going to find her and bring her. They're looking everywhere. Everywhere. I mean, it's not comforting, but I mean, they're looking everywhere that they possibly can. Sarah, when you think your daughter, how do you think she's holding? I guarantee she's frustrated. And she's a mommy's girl. And she's missing her mom. It only got worse after interviews involving both Tara and Rodney, Tori's father, showed serious tensions between the pair. By now, they had been separated for a long time and didn't exactly get on. In one interview, Tara is asked a question about the rumors and speculation floating around about her potential involvement, to which she replies that no one seems to be focusing on her daughter and that these individuals are trying to find a story where one doesn't exist. However, Rodney then steps in to give his opinion on what Tara had just said. They're not paying attention to the fact that there's a child missing and nobody's even... No, you see, that's the thing. They are, though. They, they might be saying all this stuff out on Facebook, whether it's good, bad, or anything. It's keeping the story going, and it, it's got to stay out there some way. If it's got to be negative stuff out on the internet, whatever. It's keeping it out there. We know Tori's not home, as long as people know that. It's easy enough to see Rodney's point here. He is taking the approach that no publicity is bad publicity when it comes to looking for a missing child. But it is undeniably easier for him to take that stance when he is not the one that the gossip is focusing on. It's Tara. Do you feel like the focus on your family and on your friends it will help bring Tori home at all? No. <laughs> because I know that my friends would not do anything like this. I know that anybody in my family would not do something like this. How can you guarantee that though? You can't say I that. I guess I can't guarantee can't. it, but you don't want to think for a second that anybody Because to me, in any one of these people family. standing right here could have our daughter and they're filming us just for the fun of it. Yeah, you do they have trust issues with everybody. Extreme trust. Then in another interview, Tara addressed the comments about her not crying and behaving the way one would expect a mother to when her daughter is missing. Rodney himself had cried to the media and took Tara's comments as a dig at him, and once again, tempers flared between the pair. I'm just not the kind of person that can come out here and cry for the cameras every single day. And like I've said before, if you guys want me to call you back when I'm in my home and I'm bawling my eyes out and I'm at my worst, if that'll make people feel better and maybe get some compassion out of them, then maybe I should start doing that. So what were you kind of saying because I was crying and showing my emotions and stuff, I'm behind this? No, I'm not that saying that. I'm saying that's, that. That's the way I took what you just said. No, I'm saying that people get angry because I don't come out here and I can't cry in <clears> front of cameras. And so people are holding that against me and saying that, you know, she's acting this way, so she must have something to do with it. 
Sorry, this is making me really frustrated, Tara, because this is your daughter. It doesn't matter who should be standing in front of you. I could have the world standing here and I would cry. I wouldn't care. Tori is missing. Do you what, think, Rodney, what, I'm not going to stand here and fight with you about it, okay? You know what? From now on, any of these press conferences, okay? If you want to do them, continue them. I will do mine elsewhere because, no, you are showing a total lack of support, or support for your daughter. You know no. what? You want to talk about a lack of support okay. for my daughter. Where the hell Keep were going. you for the last nine years? Okay. Where were you for the last Check nine Check every one years? of these cameras, every one of these media, every one of those police You've officers. You've been at them now, I but where were you for the last nine years? I have told years. them everything from the beginning. Yeah, walk away like usual, Tara. You're the one who's yeah. the fucking king of walking away, buddy. Yeah. Rodney, can you come back? Tori's father had effectively fed into the rumors that were already swirling about Tara and her possible involvement. If people weren't already suspicious of Tara, they were starting to question her now. But the authorities would need a lot more than a hunch to prove who was involved. While they continued to try and follow up on leads, the search for little Tori continued. The search is continuing in the uh, area of Pidock Lake with OPP's um, underwater unit. We also have the search at Oxford Landfill site that's being continued by the OPP emergency response team. That's going to be a long search. Uh, they're going through seven. Though suspicions continued, the public didn't know that the authorities had gotten a major lead, and it came from Tara herself. The CCTV footage has been circulated widely by this point, and after looking at it repeatedly, Tara contacted the police on April 12th, four days after Tori was last seen to tell them she believed the woman in the video was 18-year-old Terry Lynn McClintock. Tara knew Terry Lynn as an acquaintance. She had two previous dealings with her, one being when Tara and her boyfriend visited Terry Lynn's mother's house to purchase OxyContin, and another when Tara wanted to discuss something pertaining to dog breeding. The authorities took this seriously and looked Terry Lynn up on their system. They quickly found that she had an unrelated outstanding warrant and arrested her. Once she was in custody, the investigators began to question Terry Lynn about her movements on April 8th. She adamantly denied having anything to do with Tori's disappearance. This wasn't going to put the investigators off, though. Since Terry Lynn fit the given description for the woman seen with Tori so closely, they decided to keep her behind bars on unrelated charges and continue their investigation. Over the next 30 days, the police kept an eye on Terry Lynn, watching who she was speaking to on the phone and who was visiting her. Once such frequent visitor was a man called Michael Rafferty. Terry Lynn described him as her boyfriend, though Michael didn't quite agree. Regardless, the investigators made note of this interaction, and during one such visit, they asked if he wouldn't mind answering some questions about Tory's disappearance. Throughout the questioning, Michael maintained a calm and composed demeanor. Since the investigators still had no concrete evidence to tie anyone to Tori's disappearance, they let Michael go without further intervention. Michael left that day completely unaware that soon he would be charged alongside Terry Lynn for the murder of Tori Stafford. But who was Michael Rafferty? Michael Thomas Christopher. Stephen Rafferty was 28 years old in 2009. He grew up in Drayton with an aunt and uncle before moving away to attend Richmond Hills Alexander Mackenzie High School. Once he finished school, Michael moved to Toronto and spent his early 20s frequenting bars and chatting up as many women as he could. In 2002 or 2003, Michael moved to Guelph and got some work at a landscaping company for a few months before working at a meatpacking plant. For the next 2.5 years, Michael dated a woman called Jennifer Wilstra, who was studying to be a veterinarian. They moved in together soon after making their relationship official. Jennifer called the first six months of their relationship the best of her life. However, as time passed, cracks began to show. The couple struggled financially and went through the usual couple arguments, but what Jennifer didn't know was that, during their entire relationship, Michael was cheating on her. The pair broke up in September 2005, with a friend remarking, he was always cheating on her. She'd go home, and he'd stay at the bar. The next day, he'd wonder why she was mad at him. Michael spent the next few years bouncing from woman to woman, 
behavior that led to him searching the terms pain medication for genital herpes. A year later, in March 2008, Michael moved in with his mother, Deborah Murphy, who lived in Woodstock. They lived in a peaceful neighborhood, and Deborah reportedly kept her home immaculately clean. Deborah's boyfriend, David Riddell, also lived in the home, and he wasn't a big fan of Michael. He felt he sponged off his mother, and this behavior eventually led to David moving out. Those living in Woodstock at the time knew Michael as someone who spent most of his evenings at a local bar. A year before Tori disappeared, Michael had gotten into a relationship with 22-year-old Charity Spitzig, whom he met online via the dating platform Plenty of Fish. In early 2009, he started cheating on Charity with multiple women, all of whom he met through Plenty of Fish, one of which happened to be Terry Lynn McClintock. They started seeing each other in February 2009, and Terry Lynn was under the impression that they were exclusive. Right now, they're, they're saying they have enough evidence to verify that Victoria has passed. Um, but I myself, as Victoria's father, refuse to believe that until I actually see either the remains of my daughter or my daughter's body. I asked him, or I told him that these people will be punished to the full extent of the law. And he said that's not enough. He wants to see them in the electric chair. On May 20th, 28-year-old Michael Rafferty was charged with first-degree murder, and 18-year-old Terry Lynn McClintock was charged with being an accessory to murder for the abduction and suspected murder of Tory Stafford. Shortly before the arrests, Terry Lynn had requested to speak with the investigators. When they arrived to interview her again, she offered an entirely different version of events. Okay, because the problem you've got is you're going to have to try and get people to believe that you were only a few feet away from that car, didn't hear, didn't see, didn't notice anything about how Mike got blood all over him and Tori is nowhere to be seen, okay? And I... I think it goes right back to what you've said a few times. You didn't want to see it, okay? But that doesn't change the fact that you saw it, okay? And that's what you need to be truthful about. And I know it's hard to talk about. I know it's even harder to talk about than the sex part of it, okay? But you saw it, okay? You know you saw it. And we need to talk about that, okay? That's the last piece of the puzzle. You've been 98% honest with me. Okay, and I really do appreciate that, Terry, okay? I understand why I violated it. The interrogation footage of Terry Lynn comes after she made her initial confession. Now, the detective wants to iron out the story and try to ensure he is getting all of the information he can out of her. Okay. When I said I, I turned my head a lot, like if I was the biggest deal, it's like I'd see bits and pieces and that's it. Like I, when I seen Mike was... Tori on his lap, like, I, I turned my head because I didn't want to see it. I could hear her calling my name. <laughs> I, see, I see him. I see Tori on the ground. Okay. He said, bear with me here. Like, Take your time. And like every now and then I thought I look back to see like in all reality when I started like with that whole situation we ended up in that laneway. Like I, I kept I look back every now and then just to see if like he was still still with us. Like like I, I could hear her but I just I needed to know that she was and I knew she wasn't okay. Like, Tori's on the ground. Tori uh, on the ground. I can, I, I can hear her. Like, I can hear her. When I see her on the ground, I turned my head away again. I, I can hear her, like, the sound, the sound of her voice, like, just grow fainter. I can hear, like, moaning, like. Terry Lynn told the detective that on the morning of April 8th, she and Michael had a deeply disturbing conversation about kidnapping a young girl. Terry Lynn said Michael was goading her repeatedly, saying things like, you're not going to do it, 
and you don't have the balls. For some bizarre, unfathomable reason, instead of telling Michael he was depraved and that she would, of course, not do something like that, Terry Lynn set out to prove him wrong. Terry, Terry, let's talk about what you saw, okay? You can't have your back turned like that, right? You saw this, okay? This isn't a matter of what you heard, right? Let's talk about what you saw, right? You're concerned about this little girl, right? You're not going to turn your back on her, right? Okay, we need to talk about the things you saw. And this could come out, this could come out quickly, you know what? You know how I look at these situations like this, Terry? Because people have to talk to me about these things quite often, okay? And you, I look at this as like taking off a Band-Aid, all right? You can do it quickly and get it done, all right? Or you can just keep pulling it for a little bit at a time, and that's what hurts, right? That's what you're going through right now. We need to just tear that Band-Aid off. Terry Lynn went to Tory's school and waited for the first girl to walk out. It happened to be Tori. She insisted that, had she known how things were going to end, she would never have gone through with it. However, that argument doesn't hold much weight. What could she have possibly thought was going to happen? Terry Lynn approached Tori and started talking to her about puppies, offering Tori to go with her to see them. She readily agreed, feeling no threat from the young, petite Terry Lynn. She led Tori down the road towards Michael's car where he was waiting. Then, he exited the vehicle and pushed Tori inside once she got close. As they drove, Michael was listening to the radio for any broadcasts about Tori's disappearance. They made two stops, first at a gas station convenience store and then at a Home Depot. Terry Lynn went in, and Michael stayed in the car with Tori. Terry Lynn claimed Michael told her to go inside and purchase a hammer and garbage bags. When asked why she didn't notify the authorities or hide out in the store, Terry Lynn said she had considered not going back to the car but didn't want to leave Tori alone with Michael. Once she got back to the car with the items, they drove out to a rural forest roughly 80 miles from Tori's home. It seemed, it seemed like you kicked her a couple of times, like... Mm -hmm. The garbage bag over her head... <laughs> I didn't have a clearer like sight of Tori. Like I could see Mike before I could see anything of Tori. Like I would <laughs> use the hammer. <sighs> Where did he hit her with the hammer? I had. I see the garbage bag over, so there wasn't. Afterwards, he was pretty much what made it easy. Just like he, he knew what he was doing. Like. <laughs> Terry Lynn maintained she was not involved in any of this. That, that, that was the last time of me seeing Tori. It was when she was beside that car. Terry. Terry. Now we're 99%. Okay. Okay. You guys didn't leave. Tori there, right? You took everything with you, including Tori, and you know that. Um, no, we didn't. Like, I know that. Not. <laughs> Terry, listen to me for a second, okay? Yeah. All right? That doesn't make any sense. You've got a girl wrapped up in garbage bags right beside the door. You have to get in to get in that car. Tori, and I know that. Like, <laughs> I didn't, when I see that, what happened if Tori didn't come with us? I'm 100% that. Terry, listen to me for a second, okay? I don't know why you don't want to tell me, okay? But you need to tell me the truth about where Tori ended up. I am, I am. She didn't, she didn't stay in that field. Yeah, but I... What? She didn't. Yes, she did. I'm not, like... Her legs were, like, kind of, like, not sprawl, just... Like, I don't know how to describe them, like, I just, like, similar, similar to, like, the fetal position, like. Was she still alive when you saw them? Saw her like that? Yeah, like, she's, she's still moving. Okay. Was 
she talking? Yeah, you no, know, like, I could hear moaning that was in. I couldn't, I couldn't look, I couldn't look long, like, I looked... Terry Lynn's confession is what allowed the authorities to arrest Michael. His car had been spotted near Tory's school, and various parts of Terry Lynn's story were corroborated. Now, they needed to hear what Michael had to say. Come on in, grab a chair. Oh, that's a, that'll unfold, so that's a blanket for you there. Okay. Uh, tea. I think they might have only put one sugar in it. They got okay. it mixed up. And uh, there's a plain donut there for you. I have a cereal bar, but if you get hungry or anything else, just let me know, okay? Sure. Do you have any, uh, you have eaten since noon? Okay, are you hungry now? I get you a full meal if you want. Yes, okay. Bacon and eggs, or do you want something else? I'm too sick to talk. Okay. That's okay. You can listen. And uh, if you have any questions as we go along, there's no issues there at all. Okay? Okay. I got a few things I'll talk to you about. Um, as I told you, my name is uh, uh, Chris. My last name is Lone. I understand your name is Michael. Now, do you go by Mike or Michael? What's your preference? It doesn't matter. Okay. I'll, I'll probably call you Mike. So unless that really offends you, um, just uh, um, leave it with me. Now, you should have any problems with my name because your middle name, one of your middle names is Christopher. So I know you'll have no uh, no issues with the remembering my name. Uh, how come you got more than one middle name? Do you know? Yeah, I don't know. It's my uncles and my grandfather. I got uh, three middle names as well. And that's because really, my parents thought I was going to be an only child, so they named me after everybody. So I got named after a grandfather and two uncles. So I know what you're, I know what you're going through there, because my initials I get teased about. But uh, I'm going to go over a few things here today. Okay? It takes remarkable composure from detectives like these to put on this act of being friendly towards the suspect while knowing what they are accused of. In this interrogation, the detective begins by trying to get Michael comfortable and build rapport with him. Hey Mike, uh, like I say, don't be shy. Uh, you'll find I'm pretty relaxed, pretty laid back because I've dealt with this, these types of issues before, okay? Um, I know that uh, earlier tonight that uh, you've had an opportunity to uh, um, have your rights read to you, which you understood, and you understand your caution. You don't have to say anything, okay, to me or any other police officers. And we had an opportunity to speak with the lawyers. So there's no issues for, uh, for any of that. Now, having said that, though, any time that you have a, uh, a question, all right, don't be shy. Now, uh, I have no issues getting you any food there, so if there's something that you want, okay, I'll get you some food. There's no, no problems at all. Like I say, I get that for you in about five minutes. So, um, But my job is, as I mentioned to you, that I'm from what's called the Behavioral Sciences section. And we're talking about the, uh, the missing person one, that Tory Stafford was missing. And I know you were following a little bit in the media, and you'd follow some little bits and pieces that there was Behavioral Sciences people involved, right? And sometimes they were um, criminal profilers. Uh, there's been other members in there as well. Threat assessment, and that's what... Uh, one of my roles is as well. Uh, in threat assessment, what my job is, is to determine the, um, the risk, okay? What's the risk of a certain situation? Now, the situation that we're talking about, is you're gonna find here that there's nothing you're gonna tell me to surprise me, okay, for two reasons. One, I've heard a lot of this stuff before. Uh, the second reason is I'm fortunate enough to know what the, all the case facts are, okay? So uh, what I have to do is assess, is assess what I perceive is, is a threat. So are you gonna go out and kill more people? after this, this situation is done, okay? That's what my job is, to assess, assess threat level, all right? I already know you're, you're responsible for one, for one death, okay? So that's what my job is, is to determine, okay, what's happened here. You're here for a reason, and right back at the beginning, the investigators and the case manager, the officer in charge said that I'm gonna follow the evidence and go where the evidence leads me, okay? And now you're here because the evidence is, has led the investigators to you, all right? And then I get involved after after that, there's been people that I work with uh, in behavioral sciences that have been here from the outset of the investigation. But um, really, at this at this point in time, I mean, when I go in and look at uh, your history, there's very little on there. Like I say, you've flown under the radar. You haven't had any major problems with the uh, with the police, okay? But now all of a sudden, you're involved in this situation, and it's a serious situation, and it's a scary situation. I'm sure you're. You're quite upset and quite concerned about what, uh, what's going on here. The detective is cautious not to jump into Michael too quickly. He is comfortable alluding to the evidence they have gathered, subtly putting pressure on Michael by suggesting that whatever he says needs to connect with what they know, or else it will further implicate him in the crime. What I need to do is sit with you. Um, 
I already know how. I know the who's, right? Uh, why? I mean, why is up to you, but I can actually probably fill in that blank for you, but that's not what my rule here is. If I'm going to um, assess risk here and see, number one, do you even feel bad about what you've done? That's the first thing I look for. And number two, do I think, okay, he doesn't feel bad, so in turn he's probably going to do this again because he really doesn't care about it the first time it's happened, okay? But I also know that you've probably made some, uh, some other choices in life into uh, who you associate with, right? We've all done that. I mean, we've all brought home a girlfriend or a boyfriend or something that uh, people aren't going to approve of, and we've all had friends that our family's not going to approve of. I've done that. We all have. Okay. So that's what we have to sit and uh, sit and look at here. But uh, it, it's uh, uh, one of those things that, like I say, I'm not. I'm not at all um, upset with you. I'm not mad at you. Um, I don't mind sitting here talking with you. You'll know if I don't want to talk to you because I'll just simply leave, right? And uh, I have no issues with that. But at the same time, using the information provided by Terry Lynn and the CCTV evidence, the detective begins telling Michael what he knows his movements were on April 8th. He doesn't need to waste time by asking Michael what he did that day. They already asked him that question when he was first interviewed weeks prior. But there's no doubt in my mind, okay? There's no doubt in my mind that you're involved in the abduction. Okay, of Tori. No doubt in my mind at all. I've followed the evidence, I've read the file, okay, there's no doubt in my mind. We're past that, okay? And the only concern or the issue that I have is why you did this. What caused you to do this? Was it something you, like I say, is this something that you've done before and you've been involved in the death of other people and you enjoyed this? Am I sitting across the, the, uh, the desk from Paul Bernardo here? Am I sitting across from someone who's made a mistake, okay? And that's going to be the question that's asked of you. All right? I'll get you a bucket there in just a second. If you've got to get sick, pull your boots there. Okay? I've seen it before. You're not going to offend me or bother me. So if you got to be sick, Mike, go right ahead. <coughs> I'll get you some paper towels or something. No. If you feel like you're going to be sick, just uh, just grab the, uh, I'll have the bucket there handy for you, okay? Just leave it right there. You and I need to uh, to uh, have a discussion. This isn't uh, uh, this isn't a parking ticket, okay? This is uh, this is reality, okay? And people are, I've already told you, you know this. People assume the worst until they know the truth, okay? And people are going to assume the worst of you unless you and I sit here and clarify it. Okay, something's pushed you to do this, okay? You don't that you can't just fly under the radar your entire life, okay, Mike? It doesn't happen, it's not realistic. Okay? I'm not gonna sit and tell you that it happens. Something brings this on. And when you sit and talk to uh, uh, someone who had a troubled life like uh, Michael Breer and just gets pushed into doing this and panics and thinks, what would it be like to, to take a kid and, and touch and rub a kid? And then wish you could stop, okay? And people can When the detective began confronting Michael with what Terry Lynn had said, he could only say she was a liar. He was questioned for hours, but wouldn't break, keeping up the facade of a victim who had been wrongly accused. However, Michael could never counter the video evidence presented. Now, with the thought of two possible trials coming up, the investigators knew they needed to find Tori's body. It was the final puzzle piece, and with Terry Lynn's help, they were able to locate her. On July 19th, Tori's body was found in a heavily wooded area. She had nothing on from the waist down and was still in the Hannah Montana shirt she had worn to school on the morning she disappeared. To avoid going through a trial, Terry Lynn pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and was given a life sentence with the chance of parole after 25 years. This was after she had admitted in a subsequent interview that she had repeatedly kicked Tory. Michael's trial began on March 5, 2012, when he was facing charges of kidnapping and first-degree murder. The trial lasted until May 11th, when he was found guilty on all charges. His sentencing occurred four days later, and Michael was given a life sentence with no chance of parole for 25 years. Given the nature of his crime, it is unlikely any parole board will allow him free when those 25 years are up. Michael attempted to appeal the conviction, saying that the judges' instructions to the jury were flawed 
and resulted in an unfair verdict. Despite missing certain deadlines for filing, Michael was able to get an extension, blaming it on his inability to use the telephony to contact legal counsel. His appeal was granted, and on June 10, 2013, Mikhail attended a court hearing via video link to see whether the appeal would go any further. Further delays followed for various reasons, but on October 24, 2016, Michael's appeal was dismissed at Osgood Hall in Toronto. For years after the sentencing, Terry Lynn and Michael's names slowly faded into the background. That was until the news hit in October 2018 that Terry Lynn had moved to Okima Ochi Healing Lodge. This is a facility for indigenous individuals, and despite there being no proof of Terry Lynn's heritage being indigenous, she was allowed to transfer to this center. The Healing Lodge is much different than the prison Terry Lynn was formerly at. The unfenced facility is considered a minimum to medium security prison. For someone who had been involved in such a horrific crime, the public was not impressed with this being an option for Terry Lynn. A year after her transfer, Terry Lynn was moved back to a regular women's prison before later returning to a federal prison. The sheer depravity that these individuals showed is truly incomprehensible. How Terry Lynn found herself involved in something like that defies all logic, but it is quite clear she was acting on her own impulses and decisions. One thing is for sure. Both of them should remain behind bars for the rest of their lives for the crimes they committed.